So Gregor Arturo here. I'm going to break down some new cosmology of the universe really quick and easy and see uh, how many people can jump onto this uh, wavelength of, of thought uh, really fast. Being everything is moving really fast in this day and age that's fucking faster than rocket science. Anyways, first thing we got to like reprogram our reference point of, you know, where the fuck we are. And so we got to turn the earth completely inside out. And so, you know, China is above us, not below us. And so we have a, a concave earth. So the earth is like a geode. That does not mean that uh, the universe is, you know, super small inside the Earth, that the universe is still infinitely large, but uh, it's fractal in that uh, as you journey into the geode of the Earth, the farther away you get from the Earth, and that there's an inversion layer once you go out. Great thing though about concave Earth theory and this concept, even though there's studies um, in history such as the rectilinear experiment in Florida, where they measured the curvature of the Earth. There is also the Tamarack Mine experiments where they had two mines parallel 4,000 uh, feet down and then 4,000 feet across. And so they were able to measure the distance in the, in the mine 4,000 feet under the Earth to see how far those two mines were from. And they both confirmed the same results, uh, that the Earth has a diameter of 8,000 miles, like it, like it does, uh, but, you know, the sign's backwards, the other way around. And so, the thing that's great about this is gravity then can be more uh, applied to centrifugal force within a system than centripetal. And so, the magnetic field of the Earth is densest right at the surface of the Earth. And so, especially with uh, Walter Russell's work, you see us, he implies how centrifugal force is magnetism and vice versa, and electrostatic potential is centripetal force. And so the surface of the Earth has all this big magnetism being thrown at the surfaces, the surface of it, not thrown outwards. It's being compressed along the surface. And uh, so you have equal and opposite reactions. Newton's third law for reaction is an equal and opposite reaction um, uh, of uh, equal magnitude. And so you have centripetal force being thrown upwards. And so there's the famous as, uh, astrological symbol of the sun, the dot within the circle. The circle relates to magnetism, it's the cyclical aspect, and the dot relates to the linear aspect. And so there's places all over the planet where you have the magnetic field being thrown downwards, but then you have these infinitely thin lines raising upwards toward the heavens, toward the center of the earth. And so these uh, diamagnetic lines or diamagnetic vortices are composed of uh, electrostatic potential. And so the thing with the free energy movement is understanding how do we co coagulate that potential? How do we grow it? And so the, the big concept is you take that infinitely thin linear vortex and you start pulling it apart. And this is with the use of di diamagnetism and also in understanding the field of superconductivity in that you can, you can increase the volume of that diamagnetic vortice. This is what Nikola Tesla discovered with Wardenclyffe Tower and his work in Colorado Springs, in that when he used a three-coil system, he's able to create a non-linear gradient of the magnetic field, where he's compressing the magnetic field outwards, the centrifugal force is going outwards, and the centripetal force is going inwards. And he's increasing the centripetal force within the system. And so this is what a hurricane is. A hurricane is centrifugal force around centripetal force. These two fundamental forms of spiraling energy, inwards and outwards. And so as that diamagnetic vortice is increased, the thing is there is centripetal energy always being pulled inwards from the surface of the Earth upwards with the magnetic ma magnetism being pulled downwards toward the Earth. It's also going into the Earth, but because of the magnetic properties of the Earth, most of it gets compressed on the actual surface. And so the idea is you always have a pressure exchange between these magnetic and electric forces, between centrifugal and centripetal forces. And so with these energy systems, the primary goal is how do we increase the flow of the centripetal force outwards from the Earth um, into, say, our specific system of use. In that right now, you can say around me, it's flowing up almost all equally, unless you can say there's a diamagnetic vortice next to me, but you can also see there's some palm trees behind me, and the trees are diamagnetic. And so the actual Earth's magnetic field 
is getting thrown at the surface of the Earth as it's also flowing along the surface of the Earth. It's a standing wave, a magnetic field, and, uh, and so it's traveling in both directions. And it has to curve around the, the tree. And if that tree is living and the, the, it's oscillating with the ionosphere of the Earth, then you start to get a stronger diamagnetic response causing the magnetic field to curve around it, which creates a diamagnetic vortex within the tree. The tree then becomes a weak point in the pressure gradient of the system, and that high magnetic vacuum allows for electrostatic potential or centripetal force to flow through, where a high magnetic field uh, hinders it. They're, they're, they're literally perfectly in exchange with each other. Um, and so if you reduce the, the background magnetic field, you increase the pathways for centripetal force to thus flow through. And this is where the term coagulating is important. There's an acceleration process to where that centripetal force builds within the system. And so if you look at the surface of the Earth, the surface is composed of this, uh, you, as you see with like platonic solid layouts, a geometric layout of magnetic forces with all these focal points of centripetal force. The pyramids and other sacred sites were used to in increase the diameter, essentially, uh, of the diamagnetic vortices to allow more centripetal force to flow through. That centripetal force can then be utilized within a system to then collapse into, say, matter, which is revolutionary. It's huge. Um, and understanding that centripetal force it's like, it's like when you put your hand above the surface of the water and you get like really close and you, all of a sudden you push down fast and you get this huge explosion. It's pretty much what we're doing with all these free energy systems. Is we're creating these little uh, centripetal implosions. And from these little centripetal implosions, you're getting these massive centrifugal explosions. And so these really concentrated, dense forms of potential can be used to create massive forms of work, and this is the basis of shock waves. And so I hope that this idea has been conveyed in terms of a simple pressure exchange in that if everything is, you could say, distributed evenly around us, all you gotta do is make the weakest link. You just gotta make a point within the pressure gradient that's a little weaker than the others. And so the tops of mountains are those weak points within the systems. They naturally facilitate diamagnetic vortices because they're also closer the ionosphere, the magnetic field is piercing less into it, and so you have greater uh, centripetal forces flowing out of it. Uh, but again, there's so many dynamics with the geology of the Earth uh, that, that interact with magnetism in terms of the diamagnetic, paramagnetic, ferromagnetic properties, in that uh, everything has a interactive force around it. And so Sometimes in the metaphysical move movement, we are, we're shot down in terms of our notions of how we're utilizing metaphysical tools, such as crystals or even my wands. But like with this coil, it's copper, it's a diamond neck. Without doing anything right now, it's working. In that the diamond neck properties are a passive property in how it interacts with the environment, most specifically the magnetic environment. It's always working, it's always dancing, it's always interacting. And we have that disconnect from seeing things actually happening. In that, oh, how does this cell phone work? I, well, I have faith in the cell phone works because there's these EM waves being emitted and sending data, and thus it works even though we actually never experience really the process at hand. And that there's these processes at hand all the time, 24-7. And so we have to have a little bit of faith with the science in terms of our imagination to explore it. But then once we get there, we can be like, aha, this makes sense. This clicks in with this piece and this piece and this piece and this piece. And if these all click in, oh wait, I can fill in this last piece because this is part of the pattern of the whole and this pattern exists here in nature and exists here in nature. And so I started filling in all these little holes and this is beautiful fractal structure. Wow, look what we figured out. Hey, let's apply it to technology. Let's apply it to art. Let's apply it to real world solutions. This is biomimicry and it's fucking phenomenal. And so, but there are these fundamental blockages hindering us from moving forward. And some is even just the fundamental notion of our reference point, of where we live on Earth, of where we live within our bodies and our, and our perception to the exterior of our reality. And it's with shifting these notions 
that we create a radical shift in the whole of our reality, in the whole of our existence. And so let's start harnessing free energy. But part of that is also harnessing it between us, this collective network of putting faith in each other, trust in each other, of what it really means to be this intergalactic family. And the story is getting juicy. It's getting really juicy. So thank you for participating. I love all of you guys. Blessings and rock this week and rock it hard. Ciao.